I'm happy to have you join today for my talk on selection and management of introduced and native grasses. Um, it can be a little bit trickier to make sure I'm communicating effectively um, via the web, so please, if you do have questions as I go along, type them in, um, and I'll try to keep an eye on the chat box to be able to respond to your questions. Um, I'm Jamie Foster. I'm the forage agronomist um, with Texas A&M AgriLife Research in Beeville and in Corpus Christi here in South Texas. Um, today we're going to go over some forage production basics. Um, we'll talk about establishment of both introduced and native pastures. Um, we'll go over selection and preparing for seeding. And then we'll move into management. So once that pasture has been established, um, what do you need to do to make sure that you're managing properly so that your forage persists year after year? And we'll talk about fertilization, herbicides, and a little bit on mowing and grazing management. Um, this is a lot of information to cover. Um, I'm happy to um, answer any follow-up questions you might have as well. Um, this chart helps to show kind of where we are in relation to the, all the things that go into the science and art of managing pastures. Um, in order to have ideal and maximum forage production, you consider your stocking method. And if you're haying, you consider your mowing timing. The species that is growing there to begin with, the soil fertility, and also the environment that you're in. And if you add that to the grazing management, which would be stocking rates, the type of livestock that you manage, your stocking method, the time of lambing or calving, and any paddock subdivisions that you have, meaning rotational grazing, um, that's when you're able to um, influence the pasture utilization and then the livestock production. Because we have to have grass or legumes to be able to produce livestock or manage for wildlife. So we'll move into establishment. Um, selection of forage is based on the environment and the climate and soil influence our environment. You want to select an adapted species to the climate and the soil because the better adapted a forage species is, the fewer inputs that you have to put onto that pasture and the less management will be required to maintain the forage over time. So again, factors that affect adaptation include your climate and what I mean by that are precipitation and temperature. And climate is your average, not necessarily your weather. Um, we're getting rain today here in South Texas, but this time of year it's not necessarily so common um, to get a lot of rain without having a hurricane hit us. And the soils. Um, there are things about the soil that are innate um, due to the long-term formation of soil from the bedrock. Um, and that's what I mean here for soil. We'll talk a little bit more about soil fertility um, later on in the presentation. This map shows the average annual rainfall in Texas. And anybody in East Texas, very lucky, you're getting a lot of rain. Um, so in some parts of East Texas, it can be more than 54 inches in a year. And then we move west to areas that are receiving a lot less than 14 inches of rain a year. Um, and not only is the total amount of participants precipitation important, but the distribution is also important. And what, what I mean by that is if you're growing a warm season forage um, that's productive, you know, May through November, but all your rain's coming in the winter, it's not necessarily going to be effective precipitation for that crop. So you might need something a little bit more drought hardy. And the temperature is another factor that influences our climate. Um, I'm showing here the average temperature in January, theoretically the coldest month of the year. Um, and you can see that um, here in South Texas, we are very warm even in the wintertime, about above 56 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Um, but we get up to the Panhandle to Amarillo and 
they're going to be below 38 on average. And the reason that's important um, is because a plant's survival will be determined by the, the cold point, so its tolerance to cold. Um, so the USDA has developed hardiness zones. Um, I had to piece two maps together based on the way um, they break Texas, the West Texas and East Texas. Um, so it might not exactly match there, but you could see the general outline of the hardiness zones. And those are based on the average annual minimum temperature. And Texas ranges from zone 10 to zone 6 from the uh, USDA. Um, this applies not only to our forages, but also to landscaping plants and trees. So based on our um, climate, we have the vegetational areas of Texas. And you might notice that this map looks very similar to um, the map of our extension regions. Um, that was very logistic in nature. Um, and there are 10 vegetational areas of Texas. Um, and these factor into play with climate, the soil, and it influences what types of vegetation will grow in each of these regions. We might not necessarily see the same types of plants growing in the piney woods that we would in the Edwards Plateau. So soil factors that come into play include texture. Um, you may be familiar if you ever had a soils class with this triangle on the right hand side. And this is how we break down um, the three factors for soil texture, the clay, the silt, and the sand. So if you ever send a soil sample off for texture analysis, um, they fraction that out and you'll get a percentage of all three. Well, if you use the size of this triangle, for example, say we have 30% clay and 70% silt, um, you could see there where those types of things, um, it would be considered a sandy clay loam, clay loam, silty clay loam type of soil. Um, and you could also um, obtain this information from um, the NRCS. Texture influences water infiltration because the more clay a soil has, the slower the drainage of water into the soil profile. So you might see standing water um, for some heavier clay soils compared to sands. Um, it's because the clay particulate is a lot smaller. It's considered a fine compared to sand. It influences the moisture holding capacity after the water infiltrates and also the fertility. Um, it can also influence the soil pH, um, which then influences nutrient availability. Um, some of our clay soils tend to be more alkaline, so a higher pH, um, and that might impact things like um, iron availability to the plants that grow there. Um, it can also influence, um, or another soil factor, is soil depth. Um, a plant can reach 35% of its above ground productivity um, with a one foot deep um, hard pan. So if that hard pan is all the way down at six feet, then that plant is able to reach 100% of its maximum production. And this is the um, NRCS Web Soil Survey. Um, I don't think that I sent uh, Pete the web address to, send, to put in the chat box, but you could just Google NRCS Web Soil Survey, and you type in your address, and you can draw a polygon around your property, and it'll give you um, what soil type is in the area that you draw the polygon around. So this field here is um, the front part of the Beeville Station, and we have three different soil types here. Um, and you can see the soil types listed, and they all have names. We have Clareville, Weesatch, um, Sandy Clay Loam, 0 to 1% slopes, and then the same soil type with just a little bit steeper slope. And I say a little bit because it's only 1 to 3% slopes. So it's all very flat ground. Um, so we might not manage this little 17 acre area much different because it's all you know, considered a sandy clay loam. 
but if I had had a strip of sand in that, I might consider um, breaking that out into a different management area. Oh, it looks like Pete did post the website. Thank you. So, selecting an adapted species is one of the most important management decisions that you'll make because it is a driver of the amount of inputs that you're going to require later. There are a lot of other factors that come into play. Um, and so you need to narrow down your options. Um, know that there is no silver bullet per se. There is no perfect forage because they can be very site specific. And also each landowner may have different goals. Um, so one of the first decisions that you might make is whether you want to plant a native, a native grass or an introduced grass. Both have pros and cons. Um, I wear a lot of different hats as a forage agronomist here in South Texas because folks may want to have a coastal field for hay or they may like to plant natives so that they can have something aesthetically pleasing or um, try to manage for wildlife. Um, so either option can help you meet goals and it's important that you determine what your goals and objectives are before you set out on reseeding a pasture because it is a big investment. So you want the outcome to match with what you would like to have on your property. Um, so if balancing livestock and wildlife are your priority, you might consider natives. Um, if maximizing production um, is your priority, you might consider introduced plants, but also be prepared that um, they are going to require more water and or fertility inputs. And then be cognizant of native to where. Um, we have different ecotypes of things like little blue stem that might grow throughout the United States. Um, and it is a native grass, but um, consider an ecotype that might be native to your region. And also a decision to make is which season. Um, here in Texas, all of our grasslands are warm season grass based. Um, a warm season is planted in the spring and it grows through the summer months. A cool season crop would be planted in the fall to grow through the winter and into spring. And then the next decision you need to make to narrow down your options are whether you want to grow an annual or a perennial. And again, um, there's pros and cons to either. Annuals will establish very rapidly. They can be grazed sooner um, and, and they're highly productive, but only for one season. Um, so that means that you have a seeding cost every year um, that would include seed purchase and uh, fuel and tractor time to get that in the ground. Um, some can have toxicity issues, for example, uh, sorghum or sorgo sudans, excellent grazing, but after frost there can be potential for prussic acid uh, poisoning. Perennial forages are termed permanent pastures because they can persist year after year once they're established. It does take a little more time for these to establish. You might want to delay grazing from anywhere from one to three years. Um, before those were actually used for production. Um, the focus of this talk is on perennial grasses. Grasses and or forbs are your, your next option um, that you want to narrow down. Um, you would consider what animals um, you might be catering to. Um, cattle are grazers. So they're going to prefer grasses. Um, that's not the same with deer or goats or sheep. Um, so I always say, um, you know, Klein, glass, Klein grass is not for horses. It's a cow only grass. Um, so grasses may not be the best choice for sheep or goats. Um, I do appreciate the addition of legumes um, just to diversify the system in both introduced and native pastures. They're very excellent to add in. Um, but the focus of today is on grasses. So 
here are some options that you might consider um, if your decision would be to plant an introduced warm season perennial grass. Bermuda grass um, is adapted statewide. Um, it also will have the greatest fertility requirement. Um, Bermuda grass will persist um, given small amounts of fertilizer. However, if you do fertilize it properly, it will um, increase its productivity. So there are benefits to adding fertilizer to Bermuda grass pasture. Um, and a quick note before I continue on, um, I give general regions. I'm very well aware that um, these grasses can persist outside of these regions, but in general, if if a region is stated, um, that's where this grass would be most adapted. Um, there are seeded or sprigged options for Bermuda grass. Um, when we think of sprigged Bermuda grass, it's the hybrid variety. And uh, seeded types are commonly sold as a blend of several different um, cultivars. So the hybrid or sprig types are generally a little bit higher yielding than the seeded types. However, it's a lot less expensive um, to plant from seed than it is from sprig. And also blends are really a great option because where one cultivar isn't necessarily um, predominant or happy, another cultivar might um, like that area. So it's a little bit more of a shotgun approach, um, just to put it that way. Um, you're likely to be successful and have a nice, well-established pasture with a blend. Um, jigs is pretty common in our area. It can be susceptible to some leaf diseases. Um, it doesn't necessarily kill the, the stand, but it might set it back in some years, um, really wet years. Tifton 85 um, will outyield any of the other available hybrids. Um, it's also more drought tolerant. And it has a greater nutritive value than coastal. Um, Tifton 85 is considered Bermuda grass, but it's also a hybrid with another grass called star grass. And that's what lends it a little bit better um, yield and nutritive value. So if you're west of Austin, um, Klein grass can be a good option because it's, it's pretty drought tolerant um, compared to Bermuda grass. And it can be really productive in low fertility conditions. Um, fertilizer does increase its yield, but it requires less fertilizer than Bermuda grass. It is a seeded grass. And as I mentioned, it is a cow only grass. Um, if sheep or horses graze climb grass, there can be some toxicity issues. So if you're west of Austin and south of San Antonio, so our region here in South Texas, um, buffalo grass will be your most drought tolerant option. Um, it's also seeded. Um, the cultivar Pecos is suspected to have greater cold tolerance than the cultivar Laredo. Um, and do be aware, any plant that's out of place is considered a weed. And buffalo grass is considered a noxious weed in Arizona. And it can be invasive in some regions. So this is one we want to take care with. Uh, make sure that we're using good cultural practices like cleaning equipment um, for mowing or any light tillage um, that you might do for fall legume seeding to make sure you're not spreading it. Um, if you're east of Austin, Bahia grass um, is a really excellent option. Um, and I know most folks consider Bahia grass a weed. But there are Bahia grass breeders in the southeastern United States. Um, there's several excellent um, cultivar options for Bahia grass. It's most productive on sandy soil with a pH um, from about 5.5 to 6.5. Um, it also requires less fertilizer than Bermuda grass. It has a little bit longer growing season. So um, when night temperatures fall to about 55 degrees Fahrenheit and daylight starts to shorten, um, most of these summer grasses um, will be triggered to go dormant. Um, this dormancy is a little bit less sensitive in Bahia grass. Bahia grass is seeded, um, and you want to manage those seed heads if you're grazing pregnant mares. Um, there's an endophyte that can cause some toxicity issues. Um, so that's something to be cognizant of. 
So another introduced warm season perennial grass option would be um, Old World Blue Stem, and they will persist statewide depending on the ecotype. They're very drought tolerant um, and also cold tolerant as well, depending on the ecotype. Um, these are seeded, um, and again, your ecotype will depend on a regional recommendation because they can be very site specific. Um, and like buffalo grass, I'll note here that several ecotypes um, have become invasive. Angleton, KR, and Clayberg's blue stems, um, those I would not recommend planting if you were able to track down seed uh, from a supplier for those just because they have become invasive problems on roadsides and in pastures. Um, and we've done some work on control of that. Um, and it, it's a very difficult problem that we we're faced with now. Um, and a less common option would be Wilman Lovegrass. Um, it's an excellent grass for cattle. Um, it can be a little hard to find. There's not many seed dealers. Um, it's very drought hardy. Um, and persistent. So that can be another um, introduced perennial grass option. So if you would like to grow a grass in the cool season, um, do note that there are no traditional options that survive hot summers in Texas. This is why our pastures here in Texas are all warm season grass based. Um, because there really is an option um, to survive the hot summer. Um, there is a new uh, plant that was recently released. It's called Summer Dormant Tall Fescue. And you may have heard of Tall Fescue. It's a really excellent option in the transition zone um, of the United States, that uh, middle strip. Um, and a summer, the Summer Dormant Tall Fescue um, is a different type of tall fescue. And what it does is it shuts down in the summer. Um, and this is a picture from the plant breeder, uh, Darius Malinowski, out of Vernon. Um, and you can see um, up in Vernon, um, it survived through its second growing season. Um, and this is back in 2007. So there have been many years of research on this grass um, before it was released. If you are in the northern part of Texas, uh, the panhandle along the border with Oklahoma, this might be something for you to consider. A uh, Noble um, Research Foundation is doing, a research institute is doing some excellent uh, grazing research with the summer dormant tall fescue. Um, I did do some research trials in South Texas. Um, just don't try it if you are uh, below south of Austin. So if you desire a native pasture, um, there are many options for native warm season perennial grasses. Um, there's a list here of commonly available grasses, and there is probably three times this list that you could find available for you. Um, these are generally marketed by the seed company based on a regional basis, and this is due to the ecotype differences that I mentioned early on. Um, you want to consider native to where. So don't go buy native seed from Indiana or Wisconsin. Um, it's not likely to survive here in Texas. I also suggest a blend, and it's for the same reason that you might consider a seeded Bermuda grass blend. Um, if you have a blend of different grasses, um, they might work in some areas, very specific sites within your pasture, and not others. And then the other grasses in that blend can be predominant in those areas. Um, the most commonly uh, planted native grasses would be your blue stems, um, buffalo grass, Indian grass, and switchgrass. And buffalo grass would even be an excellent option for your lawn. I'm not going to go into detail here with the natives on where you should plant them. Um, natives tend to be a lot more site specific than the introduced, so I can't generalize. So if you do have questions on what you might plant on your property, um, you could contact your county extension agent, um, your extension specialist, 
the NRCS, South Texas Natives, or a seed company in order to get information on what they would recommend. Okay, so you have selected your forage. Now it's time to prepare to seed that forage. So the first thing you want to do is to take a soil test. So you might have looked at the web soil survey based on your property, um, or you have fence lines in specific areas, and you can break that area into management areas. Um, if you have a native, if you're planning to plant natives, you might consider testing your soil for texture, phosphorus, and potassium. If you intend to plant introduced species, you might consider testing for pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. Um, proper fertilization and pH will ensure that the forage that you're planting will persist. Also, if you know exactly what you have, you know what you need, and you can obtain the optimal return for your nutrient input. You're not putting too much out there and wasting money, in other words. So how do we do that? Um, the best thing to do is to get out of the pickup truck and walk your pasture. Um, you could do a transect like the line shown here. Uh, you could do a W or an X. But just make sure that you cover that pasture. Um, and then once you get a few holes dug, you mix those in a plastic bucket. Um, and you want to get 9 to 15 small samples to put in that bucket to send one sample in. So for your natives, you may not need starter phosphorus or potassium. If, but if your soil test shows low levels, um, you may consider applying it. And you don't want to apply nitrogen because it might encourage weed growth that will outcompete the plants that you're trying to, um, to plant. Um, for introduced forages, you may need to add nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and or lime if you have a low pH soil. And this is what your soil test report will look like. Um, this was on a graduate student's project um, that we were planting some clover, um, and this is what our soil looks like. We have our pH, our nitrate, phosphorus, potassium, and as part of this, we get a recommendation, and you want to follow that recommendation. And you want to take this soil test very early in the process. Um, if you do have a low pH or an acid soil, you want to, to incorporate your lime three to six months prior to planting. Um, the reason for that is it takes a little time in order for that lime to activate and actually um, increase the pH of the soil. And additionally, phosphorus and potassium are not mobile nutrients, and they need to be incorporated about three months prior to planting. If you apply phosphorus in a day or a week later you plant, that phosphorus at that point is not plant available. Um, so getting this taken care of uh, makes you ready to plan your pastures and work your plan. You want to make sure to control your weeds early and to have sufficient time to prepare your land and obtain your seed. So let's talk a little bit about the seed bed, including weed control. Um, you want to eliminate existing vegetation. Um, that could be with plowing or disking or herbicides. You need a clean, firm seed bed. Um, so when I'm getting ready to plant, I walk across the area, and you want your footprint to go no deeper than a quarter inch. Um, if you're drill planting, um, that is the most ideal option for seeding because it increases the seed to soil contact. You'll res it'll result in a better, more uniform stand. If you're sprigging, you want to cultipack after sprigging in order to increase the sprig to soil contact. Broadcasting is an option and you can be successful with it, um, but if you do broadcast seed, just consider that and increase your seeding rate. So to eliminate weed competition, um, you might consider a combination of tillage and mowing. 
um, and a broad spectrum herbicide. Um, this figure here is from a publication we had on um, introduced blue stem, KR and Clayberg's blue stem management. Um, you can see here that our percentage of inter introduced blue stem declined because we had tillage occur. Um, and it also declined with herbicide spraying. Um, you may need to repeat um, glyphosate because um, the plants will come back from seed or if you have a crown that wasn't completely killed, it holds a lot of energy for that plant to regrow. Um, and there was research recently done that was funded by Texas Parks and Wildlife for um, reseeding natives and repeating glyphosate was more effective than amazapyr plus glyphosate. A look on the label of your herbicide to check for the plant back interval which might also be called the rotational crop restriction or the minimum rotational crop planting interval from their last application. For glyphosate, it's seven days before you can till. For glyphosate, it's 180 days for forage crops. And for amazapyr, it's 12 months. Um, so the timing of your herbicide can really impact um, the timing of your planting because you must follow the label. Seed quality is something to consider. Um, you want to make sure that you're buying certified seed and that you consider the pure live seed. So that's shown on every seed label by law. It must be present. Um, you can see here um, for this buffalo grass, we have 99.25% pure seed and our germination percent is 94%. So if your seeding rate was 10 pounds per acre and the germination rate was 80%, what you really need to put in the planter and calibrate for is to put out 12 and a half pounds per acre. And that formula is shown here with 10 divided by 0.94. Um, that's because the germination percent is an indicator of the seed that's alive and will germinate. Generally, the smaller the seed, the lower the seeding rate. And the smaller the seed, the shallower the depth. Um, that's because that seed holds all the energy it's going to have in order to break to the top of the soil and put out its cotyledons. And then the cotyledons can begin producing energy. Um, so for each forage, it has recommendations on the seeding rate and seeding depth. Um, make sure that you've made yourself aware of those and that you've calibrated your planter and um, set the depth of the planter. Make sure that you delay grazing following planting and that would go for haying as well. Um, animals can pull out seedlings by their roots and additionally um, when a plant is cut or grazed to a shorter height the depth of rooting decreases and what you want in that time of establishment is for the plant to grow really strong deep roots so that the plant has access to all the water and nutrient it's going to need in order to persist. Um, if plants are pulled out or seeding is not uniform you can have bare ground and where bare, bare ground occurs is where weeds are going to come in. Use post-emergent herbicides where they are appropriate. Um, post-emergent herbicides are most appropriate um, when you're seeding introduced pastures. So let's move into the management of these forages after planting and uh, once they're established. So back to fertilization. So if you're haying your field, um, you want to soil test every year. If you're grazing, you can soil test every three to four years and the reason for this is that animals recycle the nutrient back through their urine and their dung but when you're haying you're taking all the nutrient off the field with the hay. 
Um, fertilize according to the soil test, but make sure that you're applying balanced nutrients. And what I mean by that is if your recommendation for nitrogen is 200 pounds per acre, and that's out of budget, so maybe you can apply 100 pounds of nitrogen, and that's great, but look at your phosphorus and your potassium and your sulfur requirement and cut that in half as well. Um, this picture shows what happens when um, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are all provided. We have maximum production. But if you are deficient in nitrogen or, or potassium, and the same would go for phosphorus, then you're reducing your yield potential. So what do nutrients do? Phosphorus and potassium are crucial for root development, and again, deep roots give the plant access to the water and nutrients it needs, and also to winter survival. Um, you apply nitrogen excuse me, nitrogen fertilizer typically to increase the yield. Um, you would typically apply about 60 pounds of nitrogen per ton of forage produced for cool seasons, and about 50 pounds nitrogen per ton of forage yield for the warm season grasses. And then micronutrients are maybe needed in small amounts, but they're still just as crucial. And you can see here, this is a bent grass, which is more of a turf grass, but it makes for a nice photo. You can see the plot area here where phosphorus is deficient and the plant is not able to survive and persist because it's lacking um, one of its key nutrients. So if you're making Bermuda grass hay and you pull off one ton of hay per acre, you've removed 50 pounds nitrogen, 15 pounds phosphorus, 40 pounds potassium, and 8 pounds of sulfur. And that's why it's important to apply the recommendation. Um, you want to replace what you're taking off. Um, and you also might need to apply um, greater than the amount taken off in order to increase your yield for the next cutting or next year. Um, just a brief mention on legumes, this talk is focused on um, perennial grasses, um, but overseeding a warm season perennial grass pasture with cool season legumes can be a good option to reduce your nitrogen fertilizer and herbicide inputs. Um, the reason for that is the nitrogen um, can be fixed by these legumes and provided and recycled through the pasture. And what tends to happen in the early spring is these legumes are shading out any weeds that might be trying to come on um, once the weather is starting to warm up. And so it can reduce um, the need for herbicide. Phosphorus and potassium are still required because legumes have a pretty high requirement for those nutrients. Um, choosing to overseed your warm season grass-based pasture is always ri risky because moisture has to be there to produce the cool season legume and then the warm season grass pasture. If this is something you're considering, you want to control weeds for a year and you want to look at that label because some of those might have a plant back restriction on legumes. Um, you want to delay your planting until your daily low is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then make sure to prepare the pasture by grazing or mowing the warm season grass pretty short, and that's to eliminate um, light competition. And inoculate those legumes. They may come pre-inoculated. If not, inoculant is pretty cheap insurance um, to make sure that legume is actually fixing nitrogen. There can be a benefit to planting cool season legumes two years in a row um, to increase the seed bank and allow for reseeding in subsequent years. Um, if you would like to manage for reseeding, you need to reduce your stocking rate or remove cattle once that um, cool season legume has gone to seed. Um, and medics with hard seed coats um, tend to work best um, and some clover species as well. That's just because the hard seed will live, it, it will not germinate in the hot summer months because if it does, then that seedling is going to die at that point.
So hard seed coats can help increase the, um, the viable seed bank in the soil. So the next thing to talk about is herbicide. Weed and brush control in established pastures can serve several purposes. Um, one is to increase grazable acres, and another is to increase the persistence of target species so your weeds won't outcompete the grass you're trying to grow. It can increase the herbage mass of target spe species, so competition with weeds decreases the water nutrient available to the grass you're trying to grow, so it can impact the maximum yield. Um, and some weed species can be poisonous to livestock. So this is a picture here of a um, mixed pasture. <laughs> we have rhizoma or perennial peanut and a nice cactus that came along. And cactus isn't always bad, um, but you could have areas where you would like to control plants that are out of place. So you need to identify the weed that you're trying to suppress before um, you select a chemical or timing. Make sure that you're scouting your pastures regularly because herbicide is most effective on younger weeds. Um, you'll need a lower um, herbicide rate and you're less likely to have to have a reapplication. Make sure that you've taken the time at the beginning of each season to calibrate your sprayer. If you're applying too little herbicide, your weed will not die and if you apply too much you're not necessarily following the label if it's above the amount the, that the label allows and that's illegal because the label is the law um, in introduced grasslands there are selective herbicides to target broadleaves um, you can spot treat with broad spectrum herbicides for grass weed grass control and there are some herbicide options like Prow H2O and Pastora that are labeled to control annual grass weeds within a perennial grass pasture. You might consider adding a pre-emergent herbicide for grass weed control. Um, the grass species for your pasture that you've planted or are managing, and even sometimes the cultivar, um, and the weed identification will determine your best herbicide option. There are lots of options and I do not have uh, time today to cover that. So here is a web link for an excellent extension publication um, that provides more information on the specific herbicides for different grasses and different weeds. Um, this is a nice comparison here from Dr. Larry Redman, our state forage specialist. Um, that compares a mechanical or chemical weed control. So if we're using a uh, six foot rotary mower compared to a 30 foot boom sprayer, our labor costs are similar, but our acres per hour um, cost is a little bit more. But we get in here to the fixed cost, operation cost, um, labor cost, etc. We can see here that our total cost per acre is about $4 more, and this was back in 2012, so it's likely higher now, um, than chemical control. So while it may be tempting to get out there and mow those weeds while they're short or um, repeatedly mow, um, consider the cost involved in that. For native grasslands, um, Consider that broadcast herbicides may affect your desirable plant species. Um, so spot treatment is something to consider. Um, ESSM, um, Ecosystem Science and Management, um, has developed an excellent um, publication called Brush Busters. And um, that can give you some recommendations on dealing with brush species. Um, and then there's a general publication as well for chemical weed and brush control suggestions for rangelands. So these are specific herbicide products for rangelands. Um, and you may consider, again, spot treating so that you're not impacting 
desirable plant species within a rangeland. Um, rangelands tend to be very diverse um, compared to introduced um, pastures, which are typically monocultures, and that's the reason um, for, for needing to be more careful with the herbicide that's selected and where it's applied. So mowing and grazing management. Um, stocking rate is generally determined through experience. Um, what it is, is it's the balancing of the supply um, or your grass with your demand, and that's from your livestock or your wildlife. Um, consider if you're using a stocking rate that was set generations ago, how the animals might be different compared to the past. Um, have your animals become larger in body size? I know ours at the Beeville Research Station are a little bit bigger these days than they were 20, 30 years ago. Has your forage productivity changed to meet the higher demand that those higher body weight animals might have? Is it less because it's a, you know, we've been in consistent droughts um, or there's been a shift in the type of forage that's growing? So it's a good idea to measure and to put pen to paper um, for your long-term planning. And that'll help you avoid over or undergrazing. Be prepared in a drought and it equals money. So you might consider taking some samples to measure the forage that you have in your pasture and con considering the demand that the animals have. Healthy pastures have stubble, and this is because overgrazing stresses plants. And once you have bare ground, soil does not hold water as well, water does not infiltrate easily, and weeds appear. Um, this photo shows continuously grazed grasses here, um, and you can see that the plant is small above ground, and that's reflected in the root mass below ground. And the more that the pasture is allowed to recover from grazing, over here to the right, the larger and stronger the above ground matter of the plant and also the root system of that plant. And again, the roots are very important even though we don't see it. It's what drives water and nutrient availability to the above ground portion of the plant. And your grazing method, um, and that would be whether you continuously graze or you have some sort of rotational um, system will determine the frequency that a plant is grazed. Um, and if you're haying, then it would be your, mo your mowing frequency that would determine that. So if you're continuously grazing, the animals may go back to that plant repeatedly within a matter of days where is if you have a rotational system, you set the rest period. You know, that could be a week, it could be a month, um, et cetera. But you could provide more rest time to the plant in a rotational system. Rotational systems tend to offer flexibility because you have sacrificed pastures during a drought. And you could also um, segregate animals based on their um, class, their species, um, age, sex, etc. Rotational grazing tends to improve animal distribution. Um, so again, it will prevent animals from grazing the same area repeatedly. And it prevents the selectivity, which again, overuse of those preferred areas. So this is the picture from the previous slide. This is our continuously high frequently grazed grass. It's going to take weeks for this grass to recover its above and below ground biomass. Whereas if we had less grazing, more of the take half, leave half rule, it takes days for that plant to recover. And here, very light grazing, it may just take hours for the plant to recover from a grazing event. Um, so that's all I have to share today. Um, I do want to let you know about Forage Facts, which is a website um, from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Overton, uh, Vanessa Olson, a forage specialist there. Um, you might consider 
um, signing in and entering your email address to subscribe if you're interested in forages uh, very timely articles are delivered every Friday afternoon um, topics such as uh, weed control and fertilization in pastures um, the, the web links and more information are available um, on Dr. Megan Clayton's website South Texas Rangelands um, with that, I will take any questions, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Let's go ahead and, and uh, y'all go ahead and type out your questions, and Dr. Foster will be uh, glad to answer the questions. <clears throat> While you type out your questions, uh, let me say this, that uh, this, this slide says the survey is going to pop up, but it's actually not. Uh, because I had some difficulties. If you type in your email address, I'll be glad to send you the survey. And can I, I can also send all those web links that Dr. Foster provided to you during the registration if y'all if like those. So I just send them together. And please complete the survey after you get the link. And another thing, if uh, if you attended for CE credit, uh, be sure to put in your email address on the chat pod. And kind of as well as we would, there's a question. The question is um, that uh, Jeff has an established coastal hay meadow that is starting to get common Bermuda. Is there any easy way of getting rid of the common without destroying the coastal Bermuda? Um, I don't know about easy. Um, one option you might consider would be to use a pre-emergent. Um, and what that would do is prevent the seed of the common from germinating and sprouting new plants because it is a seeded uh, variety of uh, Bermuda grass. Um, as far as getting rid of what's already growing, no, it's, there's not really an easy way to do that. Um, so given um, high fertilization, the Tifton 85 should take over. But that being said, common Bermuda is not a bad forage grass. Um, it, it does make your Tifton 85 um, not necessarily pure um, if you were to sell sprigs, but the hay coming off that field um, given proper fertilization should be excellent quality hay. Um, hopefully that answers your question, and if not, type another one. <laughs> um, so Pat asked the question um, that they planted Big Four native mix, and it's a very fine, light seed. Um, they're only planting a small pasture, but ended up hand seeding. Um, so what is the recommendation for a small, poor farmer to distribute such seed? Um, it can be difficult. Um, you have options, though. You might talk to um, your NRCS or your county extension, or even your soil water district to see if they might have equipment that you could borrow. If not, um, there are broad push broadcasters um, that are a little bit bigger than you might use for a small lawn, or there are pull behind broadcasters for like an ATV. And those may be options for you. Um, I hope that helps give you some resources. And uh, Mark's asking if you want to introduce natives to Bermuda grass, should you mow low before disking? Um, I don't think that uh, mowing before disking will necessarily help anything because you're going to need repeated disking and spraying with glyphosate. Um, so you could mow or not before your first um, tillage event um, but what you want to do is get that area dissed when you have green up spray with glyphosate and then after it's um, died till it and then when it greens back up spray with glyphosate and that could take several times um, because Bermuda grass is so per persistent um, to make sure that it has um, killed the Bermuda grass and especially those underground rhizomes um, before you uh, are able to reseed. And Randall's asking 
if there are any recommendations for elimination of grass burrs prior to seeding a new pasture and the time frame prior to planting. Um, Pastora is a name brand labeled option um, for treatment of grass burrs. However, I am not aware of the um, replant interval on that. Um, so you would need to check the label for the time frame prior to planting. Um, another option is back to Mark's question and um, trying to um, get rid of Bermuda grass before you plant natives. Um, your other options would be to till, turn that seed bank up, spray with glyphosate, and then repeat tillage glyphosate um, until you have a clean seed bed. Um, Levi Sparks is asking if you should till in a very shallow soil depth such as in the Edwards Plateau area. Um, that could be very site specific. Obviously, um, you know, if you have a rock bed area, and I'm, I grew up in that region of Texas, so I'm well aware of what you're talking about. Um, yeah, if, if you have rocks on top of the soil, that's probably going to do more damage than good. So you would likely rely on herbicides. Um, in that case, just make sure what you're using would be labeled for that type of uh, land area. And uh, Julieta is asking if there's an email list for information on seminars like this. I'm going to turn that question to Pete. And he did answer the website texasrangewebinars.tamu.edu. Um, Yes, if you go to the Texas Range Webinar .tamia .edu, on the right panel, you'll see an email subscription. You can actually sign up. 